Okay, so welcome everyone to our CCA this one class. Is being um, just a real quick um, update. Pod two was had an uh, an error on it in that it would boot just to switch one pod two would boot to switch colon. And what that was is someone erased the iOS image. Um, and uh, Dot Reynolds asked, "Who has the power?" Yeah, we have the power. To, right? Yes, you do because you're in as privilege level exec level fifteen, so you can erase the iOS images. Um, I ask you, don't do it on purpose, especially. It happens by mistake sometimes. Um, but that is the one thing that uh, NetLabs cannot recover from. It cannot recover an iOS image being erased on a switch. Um, yeah, Dr. Ward, if you were anybody in pod two, I hope, it, I hope and pray it's only been on one or two pods. I hope someone hasn't gone through and destroyed a large number of switches. Um, I'm going to go in here and do a couple, couple quick reservations just to make sure but it should have been just on pod two that's the only one i saw and i know that's the one that had the issue um and so i um let's see what lab 1044 it's lab 1044 i was seeing someone had done it on it um but that it happens on occasion when it does we have to take the pod offline we have to do a little bit of work on it um actually we have to reload the image and it's it's a it's a pain in the rump I'll, I'll be honest with you it's not an easy thing to recover from um yeah but dr ward yeah if you're in pod one through or pod two that's why you got that switch colon i would suggest honestly like i've said uh, move up to pods five through 20 and use those because i think you will be um one they shouldn't be as uh, in use as the other pods and um, that way you'll be able to get your times. And like I said, if you ever need to extend your pod and there's a reservation right after you, you cannot extend your reservation. So if you go out to the pods that are used a little bit less, then there's the better chance that you can extend your reservation when you, if you need to, okay? Thanks, that was my question. I couldn't extend it and ran out of time. Yep. And I didn't know how to save it as well. Can we? Yep, I'll show you that. I got save I got it. Which, yeah, I can show you how to save it. Um, there's a couple ways. One is you can just copy them out into uh, text documents um, and copy them out to, to text and then paste them back in. Um, you do extensions. Yeah, I'll, uh, okay, I'll answer Alex in a second. Um, but yeah, you can copy them out to a Word doc or not a Word document. You don't want to do Word because Word puts in characters you can't see and will cause little problems when you try to paste them in. I always use Notepad and save uh, the configs as text files. I'll show you how to do that, but I'll also show you how to save the configs and then you can load them back in. But um, again, the reason you couldn't do an extension, Karen, is probably because someone had a reservation right after your reservation. So go up further into the, into the 20 pods and there's less chance someone will have a reservation right after you. So and that's, a suggest, that's just a, a life lesson that, that's a good one to learn. Real quick, when you can tell me yes or no, uh, I'm, I'm willing to th throw away $300, go ahead and take the test just to see what this is about. Yep. Uh, can you yep. do that without having taken the other two 16 week classes? Oh yeah, 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 they'll take your money. Yeah, Cisco will take your money in a heartbeat. So yeah, uh, feel free to. Um, I think what's gonna really get you some of the things we haven't done like VLANs, hands-on, um, right on a stick, some of those things are gonna kind of give you a little bit of trouble because they, they do ask you about those, but yeah, you're welcome on it. Uh, yes, Dr. Dr. Reynolds' exam is definitely based on all three classes. And Alexia, the, uh, is it Alexia? Is that, I'm saying her name right? Alexa, Alexia. Okay, either way, yes, you can do extensions. The only time you can't do an extension again is like if someone is scheduled right after you, then it won't let you extend it because you would interfere with that person's lab. So that's the reason why. Let me uh, let me share my screen. I got to give you all one thing. Brian and uh, Michael are still sick. They both have COVID. Um, so I have so far, knock on wood, um, not come down with COVID, even though I traveled extensively with both of them. Um, but we have no class Monday, July 4th. Spend time with your family, eat hot dogs, go see some fireworks, but we are not having class July 4th. I canceled that class. Um, so no class July 4th. We will be meeting the 6th, but I just want to make you aware of that we are not meeting on the 4th. Any questions about that? Oh, we can just catch up and do stuff. Thank you. Yep.
Okay, so here's NetLabs, and let's see, I'm in pod five. So I'm click pod five here and make sure switch still booting. Okay, yeah, it's still being in use. So I believe this one's okay. I'll show you, let me let it finish up. Yeah, this one's fine because we've got switch, uh, switch pound, which means it loaded. Plus you can go up here and you can see that it loaded the, uh, loaded the iOS image. The router, is, the router is still loading. So we'll come back to that. I'll come back to lab in just a second. I want to go ahead and talk about module nine right now. Um, yeah, please do, because they're both, they're not, neither one of them is extremely sick, um, but they're they're not feeling great. So uh, I told them, I said, the only thing I had is I'm extremely tired, but uh, if I wasn't tired, I'd be worried about myself um, after the last two and a half weeks I had. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about, um, I want to go, Back to nine. Right now, by the way, if you look at our syllabus, you should be in modules eight and nine. Okay. We're only a month in the class, folks. So don't be freaking out. Everything's okay. You got plenty of time. This class lasts into August. So you've got another whole month that, that we're going to be working on these things. But I want to make sure you understand ARP and how ARP works and how it maps known IP addresses to unknown MAC addresses. So First off, if you are looking at IPv4, now this is IPv4, not IPv6. Oh, God. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me that pod seven also has an image, an issue. Golly. No, this means that somebody's done a class and not taught their students the correct way to, to do things. Holy moly. <sighs> okay, let me, I gotta send an email folks. Give me one second. Pod seven. So I might so would you recommend us move on and come back to this later? Give you guys a chance to fix it? Nah, we'll get it fixed. I'm just gonna take those what? two pods offline. I'm not gonna, it's no big deal. I'm just gonna take them offline. Pod seven also. What? this means somebody didn't teach their students the correct thing the correct command is delete flash colon vlan.dat and that gets rid of the vlan.dat file more than likely someone is putting in erase flash colon and so that's what's going on it's somebody who's teaching vlans right now in the system and they haven't taught their students the correct commands to actually erase vlans um Taking, let me get it real quick. Taking pod seven offline. Right. I got to put this to myself a message. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me give me just a second here. Y'all going to get to me logging as administrator. Actually, you're not going to get to see me log as administrator, but I'm going to log as administrator and show you what we can do. Yep, it does happen on occasion, and typically it's it's probably the same student who's just bounce into a different pod and killing pods all right so what we will do is we'll go down to pod seven and whoever's on pod seven i'm going to take your pod offline so um i'm taking pod seven offline so that's how we can bring pods on and offline like we do um but pod two and pod seven we're showing the same issue so yeah all righty now dr ward i don't think it was you i don't think you did it i think it's uh I think it's another student who was doing it. Uh, Jessica, unfortunately, no, it would not. Uh, there's no way to disallow certain commands inside of NetLabs, unfortunately. Um, thank goodness. Oh, sorry, Dr. Ward, that was you on pod seven. Okay, no problem. It'll just kick you off. Um, so you'll have to start a new uh, start a new reservation on a different pod. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, now back to switching gears back here to how do we find our MAC address if we know our IP address. In IPv4, we're gonna use ARP. 
So if we're on the same network, what would happen is I would need to know the destination MAC address in order to build the frame in order to get to uh, from PC1 to PC2. If I don't know that, I'm going to send out an ARP request and get an ARP reply directly from the PC. On if it is a remote host, so it's a host that is on a remote network, I still send out my ARP request. But the host, since an ARP request is a broadcast and cannot pass through the router, that remote host PC2 cannot respond to me. So what actually happens is the router responds with its MAC address for that remote host. That is used to build the frame. And the frame can then, the, the PC1 can then send the frame and it goes over to its default gateway and gets routed to the correct. This is something that many times shows up on the CCNA is the ability uh, for you to understand the difference between a local host and the ARP request process and a remote host in the ARP request process. So if you have questions about this right now, please let me know. Let me know if you don't understand how this works. By the way, uh, if you were asked about what layer protocol ARP is, ARP is a layer two protocol. Um, so it is a layer two protocol. How much IPv6 is there on there? Bunches. That's where I got confused with IPv6. Bunches, and there's more coming. Um, I think you will see more and more IPv6. Uh, one of the things that came out of SkillsUSA last week, one of the network engineers that worked for Cisco stated, I am seeing more and more IPv6 TAC-related calls and more and more IPv6 being actually placed into networks in North America. So it's already fairly prevalent in other parts of the world, um, but it's finally starting to become pre uh, prevalent here in the United States. So there's a good amount. Now I will tell you for IPv6 on the CCNA, really what you need to know is, is how IPv6 addresses work, how to summarize, you know, how to shorten them correctly. Um, you need to know the difference between a linked local address and a global address. You also need to know how to put IPv6 addresses onto an interface. Um, and how the three ways that IPv6 addresses can be given out uh, dynamically, which we've talked about, Slack, Slack with um, stateless DHCP, and then Slack with stateful DHCP. So those are all the different ways. Okay, now um, I want to move on and talk, here's ARP, talking about the ARP request and ARP reply. So I don't know who to send it to, uh, I know the IP, I need the MAC address. It sends out an ARP request, gets an ARP reply. Pretty simple, um, not anything that's massively crazy. Now realize, here's one problem that does happen. Since the ARP request is sent to all Fs, every one of these hosts has to bring it up at least to layer three and look at it and say, is this my IP address before it can reply or drop the packet? Um, so, or the frame, it's really a frame, drop the frame. So be aware that that is one negative of our, the fact that it is sent to a broadcast address, all these hosts have to listen. That's gonna be different when we talk about IPv6 and the neighbor discovery protocol. Okay. So ARP is very simple. And we talked about, I've shown you this, removing ARP addresses or putting ARP, uh, do the show IP ARP on a uh, router or switch or on a router. You show, um, show MAC address table on a switch that will show you the, um, the ARP entries. On a uh, PC, you can do um, netstat -a, um, excuse me, ARP-A to see the items on that. So let's move to IPv6 because this is where it is a little bit different. Now, IPv6 does not allow broadcast. There are no broadcasts in IPv6, technically. Now there is a thing called a solicited node, all nodes that can be sent. So it's, it's a multicast address that kind of functions like a broadcast, but technically any exam question that would ask you, is there a broadcast in IPv6? The answer is really, there's no broadcast capability in IPv6. What we have is we have these neighbor discovery messages. Okay. Um, by the way, down in, Chapter 12, we're gonna teach you about the slack and the way you get IP addresses. But basically IPv6 uses ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol version six, 
to perform all of its functions in terms of um, duplicate address detection, router um, solicitation, which is finding out if there's a router on its local link, router advertisements, all of those things work through IPv6, ICMP v6 messaging. So we got a neighbor solicitation, neighbor advertisement, router solicitation, router advertisement, and redirect. We will learn a lot more about these in the very near future when we discuss how you get an IPv6 address. But right now we're trying to learn how, if I know an uh, IPv6 address, how can I find the MAC address for that particular known IPv6 address? There's no ARP. There's no ARP in IPv6. So what we have is a solicitation. We have the ability to do a neighbor um, discovery protocol. So we're going to send out a neighbor discovery. So it basically is an ICMP message that says, hey, whoever has 2001 DB8 ACAD colon 1 colon colon 11, I need your MAC address. Now here's the good news. This is the difference between IPv6 and IPv4. When this neighbor solicitation message actually goes out, all right, the multicast address that it is sent to actually is sent and created using part of the IP address that is they're trying to find. And that host who has one colon colon 11 actually is listening on a special solicited node multicast address. And you don't need to understand a whole lot about this other than this is what happens. When you put an IPv6 address on a host or it gets an IPv6 address in any way, it registers a solicited node multicast address associated with that IPv6 address. That same solicited node address can be created by using the IP address it needs to go to. All right, so here's what happens. When this goes out and gets sent out, multicast out, not broadcast, multicast out, the only host that really has to take it beyond layer two is PC2. Other hosts, and I'll show you, I'm actually gonna show you the video because it's a really good video, at least part of it. Other hosts won't have to do it because they don't listen on that solicited node multicast address. But then what it will do, it was a, if a neighbor solicitation comes out, PC2 will respond and say, hey, that's me. My MAC address is this. So it works just like ARP, but it doesn't use broadcast, it uses multicast. Broadcast, use multicast. I, I still don't understand how colon 11 knew that this question was coming from colon 10. Because it's in- It's not the, in the packet. Yes, it is. It's in the information in the, in the frame itself. It's, it's part of the neighbor solicitation message. The sending host IP address will be in there. Okay, okay. Yeah, when you look into the payload of that, it has the sending host IP address. So that's how it knows. So let me do this real quickly. Let me find this. I'm gonna tell me if y'all can hear the video here. I'm gonna just show you this real quickly. In this video, we will discuss the process of how IPv6 performs address resolution using ICMP v6 neighbor solicitation and neighbor advertisement messages. This is similar to the ARP process used by IPv4, but has certain advantages that we will see in a moment. Host A has a packet to send to host C. Host A has determined that the destination IPv6 address is on the same network as host A. By the way, that's important because if it's on a remote, it's going to have to do something different. It's going to have to involve the router, but this is just for local right now. Host A knows the destination IPv6 address, but needs the associated destination MAC address, so it can encapsulate the IPv6 packet in an Ethernet frame to send directly to host C. Host A examines its neighbor cache to see if there's an entry for this destination IPv6 address. Similar to an ARP table, the neighbor cache maps IPv6 addresses to MAC addresses. For simplicity's sake, MAC addresses are shown here as four hex symbols instead of the usual 12. As we can see, there is no MAC entry associated with this IPv6 address. The IPv6 packet is placed on hold and host A creates an ICMPv6 neighbor solicitation message. This is similar to an ARC request used for IPv4 address resolution. 
One significant difference is that ARP messages are sent directly over Ethernet. IPv4 is not involved. The IPv6 address resolution process uses ICMPv6, which is then encapsulated in an IPv6 header and then encapsulated in an Ethernet header and trailer. The ICMPv6 neighbor solicitation header includes the target IPv6 address, which is the same destination IPv6 address in the packet that is on hold. The target IPv6 address is mapped to a special IPv6 solicited node multicast address which is then mapped to a special Ethernet multicast MAC address. This mapping process contains a significant portion of the target IPv6 address. This allows for the Ethernet NICs on each device that receives this frame to determine whether or not to accept and process the frame. This is where we see an advantage of ICMPv6 neighbor discovery over ARP for IPv4. Since ARP uses an Ethernet broadcast address, all devices on the local network must at least partially process an ARP request. Okay, so do you understand that? That's where that solicited node multicast is. Multicast. No, I don't get it. Can you walk through that again? I'm, I'm just okay. following along, but it right. doesn't so, make sense. All right, so here's what happens. Every time you put a, an IPv6 address onto a host, it gives itself a solicited node multicast address. Now, the, the negative is we haven't gone over this yet. Um, yeah. hold, hold on one second. Let me let me pull something up. All right, we're going to the holy holy Wikipedia. All right, so here it is. A solicited node multicast address is an IP. V6 multicast address used by the neighbor discovery protocol. And what happens is when you have, when you put an IP address on a host, now this is showing a unicast address, which is actually a link local address, but it actually builds itself a solicited host address based off of its, its actual IPv6 address and will be listening at all times. Let me see if I've got IPv6 on this machine. I don't even know if I've got it turned on on this machine. Yep, I do. Um, I'm not showing my listed node multicast address. Hold on a minute. Yeah, mine's not showing it here. Um, but what happens is it, if you have an IPv6 address, you have a solicited in a node multicast address based on that IP address. So in our example that we have here, because, let me make this full screen, because this node C has a, an IP address on it, okay? It builds a solicited node multicast address based upon that. Likewise, A knows the IPv6 address it's sending to. So it takes the same process that it normally would use to create its own solicited node multicast address and builds that, that node address to send out the neighbor solicitation message to. So in some ways, that neighbor solicitation message is actually, a, it's a multicast, but it's only being directed towards the actual recipient because everyone else will not be listening on that solicited node multicast address. Do you know what multicast is? I guess that's another good question. Does anybody know what multicast is? Yeah, you're sending one not to everybody, but one to a few. One to a few, and it is a few who have joined that group. In with a solicited node multicast address, the only person that should have joined that group or the only entity should be the entity that has that one address. And so that's what's being used here. It's being used so that it can so send it. Send it a unicast. That's what I don't get. Why isn't it a unicast? It knows the IP address. And the guy, is, so the IP address is the number on the mailbox. The solicitation right. is the actual mailbox. Yeah, but here's the problem. It doesn't know the street address because it doesn't have the MAC address. So it's the equivalent of knowing that it's in, it's in Atlanta, Georgia, but I don't know what street it's on. And so that's why it can't build a frame because it doesn't have the MAC address. So think about it. It can't send a unicast because it can't build a frame because it doesn't have 
a MAC address to send it to. Okay. But it can use as the destination MAC address, a multicast address, which is the solicited node multicast address. And so that's how it's doing it. It's using that multicast address as the destination MAC. It just so happens the only one that's gonna to respond to that is the host that actually has that IP address. And then once it does that, it can actually get the true MAC address of that host and it can respond. Neighbor okay. solicitation message is forwarded by host A and received by the switch. The switch will flood the ethernet multicast frame out all ports except the incoming port. Host B receives the ethernet frame. Hot mic. Ethernet Okay. Nick examines the destination MAC address. The Ethernet NIC will accept frames whose destination MAC address matches the MAC address on the NIC, is a broadcast MAC address, or a multicast MAC address that maps to one of its IPv6 addresses. In this case, the multicast MAC address does not match any of these, so host B's NIC ignores the rest of the frame. Without and it drops it, so it just chucks it in the bit bucket and lets it go. But now C is pass different. It up to an upper level process to make this determination. Again, this is an advantage over ARP for IPv4. Why is that an advantage over ARP? What does ARP have to do with every single ARP request that comes to every single host? It has to look broadcast. at the I broadcast. Yeah. Yeah, it's a broadcast. So it has to bring it up, take it all the way apart at layer two, send it up to layer three, and see if that's its IP address. So B is already. IPv6 is already faster because B was able to drop this after just realizing, hey, that's not a multicast address associated with any of my IPv6 addresses. Okay, now let's see what C is going to do with it. Router R1 receives the frame on its R1 does interface. the same thing. A similar process occurs on R1's interface. Move the along. Ethernet NIC ignores the frame because the destination multicast MAC address does not map to any of its IPv6 addresses. ICMPv6 neighbor solicitation messages are not forwarded by the router. This is because the solicited node multicast address in the IPv6 header is sent with link local scope, which tells the router not to forward these packets off the local link or network. Host C receives the Ethernet frame. This time, the Ethernet multicast MAC address matches a MAC address associated with host C specifically the one mapped to host C's IPv6 solicited node multicast address. Therefore, host C accepts the frame and passes it up to its IPv6 process and then its ICMPv6 process. The target IPv6 address in the ICMPv6 header matches its own IPv6 global unicast address. So host C knows it is the target of this neighbor solicitation message. Before replying, host C adds the IPv6 and MAC address of host A to its own neighbor cache so it can return a neighbor advertisement message. Host C replies with an ICMPv6 neighbor advertisement message sent as an Ethernet unicast message directly to host A. The ICMPv6 header includes host C's IPv6 address, which host A already knew, and the associated MAC address that host A was requesting. Host A receives the Ethernet frame, examines the IPv6 address and the MAC address in the ICMPv6. And now at this point, it can take that information and use it to build the um, frame that is on hold down below here. So a neighbor solicitation gets sent out, it's sent to a solicited node multicast address, which will only be responded to by the host that has the IP address of the node that's being requested. And then it will send back its MAC address and then it can build the frame and send it. I still don't see how that's any different from IPv4 because so, it's doing uh, the same thing. They broadcast it out. No, they and... do not broadcast it. No, basically, I, basically, I think uh, uh, every group of computers have a specific multicast address. Correct. And so they, they are a family. 
And so the, the multicast address is not one for all. So it's going to be for every group of family, they have a specific multicast address, and then it will reach that family. And from there, it will find the specific computer and the specific IP address, uh, MAC address, yes. That is correct. And, th okay. and in this case, it's a family. Subdivision. It's, it's all gonna go to that subdivision. It's a family of one in this case because it's a solicited node multicast address that is associated with that one IP address. Now, Karen, here's the thing. In practicality, the way it works, it is very similar, but it is more efficient because it's not broadcasting, it's multicasting. And so in a little network like this, a broadcast wouldn't be that big a deal, but imagine if you had 40 hosts on this network then things become much different because you've got all these hosts trying to send these different um, art requests. Well, not art requests, neighbor solicitation requests. So who sets up this neighbor solicitation that you're talking about here that it goes to? The host that is needing to know the MAC address sends the neighbor solicitation. Right. The, not the host. But you said these are one big family. So you got 45 computers. How do you divide up families? No, no. Back up a second. I just told you it's a family of one. This host only has, is the only host that has the solicited node multicast address for this IPv6 address. It's the only one. So when A sends it, only one host is going to respond. All right, but what you said you could have 45 in that family. No, you can have 45 on this network. Right. 45 different hosts could be on this network, but each one of them is going to be in their own singular solicited node multicast um, group for their configured IPv6 addresses. Who so, formulates the group is what I'm trying to say. The, the machines do it on their own using the process for creating a solicited node multicast address. So, so I have a question. I have a they question. do it on their own. Yeah. Uh, the solution, uh, is there any like distinctive, like distinctive address, multicast solicitation uh, address they have? Is that is the difference from the different computer? Um, they have a different address, right, for the, each computer? Yes, every every one yes. of them will have a different list of node. So the host address. which has been sending knows the the which one he's sending it, right? Correct. Correct. So that means even if it is a forty five computers, it's the, the host is not going to send to the forty five. Only is going to send one of them. He already knows, and it has right. the MAC address and also that. But others, you are saying that other forty four one they don't have. They have the address but they're not specifying which one they're sending. Right, so here, here's what it is. The node address is created by taking the least significant 24 bits of a unicast address and appending them to the prefix FF02 colon colon one colon FF0. So you take the last 24 bits of the address on the host and that becomes the solicited node multicast address. So Karen, your question is, how does it get created? It gets created automatically using this process right here. So every host, the second you put an IP address on them, an IPv6, either link local or any kind of unicast address on them, they create a solicited node multicast address for themselves. So in this example here, when PCA needs to send something over to, over to PCC, uh, it knows the IP address because it's trying to find the MAC address for this IP address. So it uses this solicited node process, okay, to create the address it's going to send it to. And that address will only match host C because they're both using the same process, the last 24 significant bits of the, uni the unicast address to create the solicited node multicast address. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Why could like, you create if you've got the whole IP address here? Why strip off the last six? I, I just I don't I, I'll 
keep going and I'll. Yeah, here, here it is, Karen. It's a, it's a chicken and egg problem. <laughs> Here's your chicken and egg problem, okay? Yes, I have. Okay. Right here, I have the full IP address, but I don't have the MAC address. I cannot do the MAC address because I don't have it. So even though I know the whole IP address, I can't put it in a frame. So why doesn't he just say, hey, I got your IP address. What's your MAC address? Send it That's back exactly to what you. he's doing. That's exactly what he's doing. But instead of having everybody do that, he's actually sending it to a special address that says, hey, the person who has this IP address, I know you are listening on this channel. Respond to me. Hey, that makes sense. Yep. OK, uh, somebody just gave me a good, good uh, thing here. Let me see it. Net show net IPv6. That didn't work for me. Hold on. I'm in. I obviously don't know PowerShell. Let me try this again. Who is it? Uh, Eddie? Let's, uh, I'm trying to do this here. Let's see. Let's see. Any, I just any, did the regular command prompt. Yeah, IPv6. I'm trying to, I'm getting, this is what I'm getting when I do that. Let me bring this over here and we'll, we'll try to figure this out. If I could show, I think if I could show her my solicited node multicast address, which I could do it on a router, but I don't like to boot the whole router up. Um, Forget the last part of show joins. All right, show. You do the net, net sh okay. interface IPv6 show joins. IPv6 yep. show joins? Yeah. J O I N S? It's two words. Okay. I admit I've never done this. So I'm learning something too. Okay, here we go. Let's find my actual physical. Okay, let me do something else here real quick. Okay. If everybody else is getting it, go ahead and no, I'll no, come I, back it's, and it's watch doing. it for a while. I'll get it. It's worth doing it. Uh, so here we go. Here we go. All right, let's do this. Let me show you this. All right, so here is the IPv6 address that is currently on my host. It's FE80, so I've got a link local address, but the last 24 bits are right here, okay? You will see that my ethernet interface is part of a group right here, FF02, colon, colon, one, colon, FF91D141. So my machine took the IPv6 unicast address that is on it and joined this listed node multicast address. So I'm listening for anything that comes in to that address. And anytime you're part of a multicast address, and, and this may be where the confusion is coming in, Karen. Anytime you're part of a multicast group, you are also part of a special MAC address group that maps to that multicast address. That is what gives the sending host when they do a neighbor solicitation. That's what gives them the MAC address to put into the frame to be able to send out the solicitation. So I am listening on my machine on a special MAC address for anything to come in that's a neighbor solicitation message. Okay. okay. And so that's why in this entire process here, this host, can take and put in this destination MAC address, the multicast address that is associated with the host listed node multicast address and send it out. And then only C will listen because only C is going to be listening and be part of that multicast group. But you now, can have more in that solicitation group. You just could, one, you right? could, but in this particular case, the way it's created, you're not going to have anything else because it's based upon your actually configured IPv6 address. 
Okay. Now, let me show you this. Okay. Let me do this. I'll, I'll go one. Uh, let me go one, one step further here. Solicitation address almost like a subnet. So you're you're going to a subnet to try and find it. I'm trying to uh, visually. It's not a subnet. It. It's a multicast group. So it's it's kind of like a. I guess you could kind of call it that, but it's not really a subnet. It's a it's a multicast group. Multicast is its own beast. I will tell you that it is its own little thing um, that we have to kind of. We don't spend much time at all talking about multicast and CCNA. Now that's a massive CCNP topic. Uh, in fact, I sat down at Cisco Live and two engineers that work at ISPs were, and actually one of them worked at Time Warner was sitting there talking about um, their multicast setup. Let me do this for you. Let me, let me try something. Hopefully I won't kill my campus's network doing this. Um, I'm going to actually give myself an IPv6 address, a static address. So I'm gonna put on my machine, the IP address, 2001 colon db8 actually 2001 be bad be bad colon one colon colon 10 slash 64. I'm gonna click OK. I'm gonna click OK. I'm gonna minimize this. I'm gonna minimize this. And I'm gonna do an IP config and see if we don't get that now. So uh then we'll do it to an IP config slash all. Right, see if I can get that address on my. Yep. Okay. So I have the address 2001 be bad, be bad, colon, colon, colon 10. All right. Now, what should happen now is I should be able to run this command again. And I should see eventually, and it may take a little bit. But I should join another multicast group associated with that. And actually, I may not. And let me tell you why. Because I'm already part of it with my link local address. So it'd be probably a better idea if I do this instead of that. Let me train. Let me change this. I'll change it so you'll see. I'm flying without a flying without a uh, net here, y'all. So, okay. So there's my link. One of my I just put a new link local address here. Now again, it may not join a new group because I've already got that other one in there. Yeah, so it's not one to take over because it's got the one. I would have to actually shut the interface down and bring it back up. Isn't um, it right there on interface seven? Is it on seven? Right there. What about D141? That's yeah, the that's, a, that, that's the existing one, though. That's that one right, right there. Right above it is 200. Oh, there it is. Yep, I'm a doofus. Sorry. Man, I can't see today. So there, you'll see now, since I put another link local address on here, I joined that listed node multicast address. Why would you have two link local IPv6 addresses for the same NIC card? Well, here's where you get into some things that are just, just you got to understand about IPv6. We haven't got to the chapter yet. You can have multiple IPv6 addresses on an interface. Um, so that's just, that is a common thing with IPv6, the capability to do that. Well, not many people do it, but you can do it. So just be aware that that is one of the weirdnesses of IPv6. This is starting to go against all rules of IPv4. Well, not really, but it, it is very, it is different. Uh, and one of the things I will tell you is you would not have two link local addresses on, on a single host. That's very, very uncommon. I've not known of any, any instance where that is, that happens, but I just wanted to do this to show you the example of the fact that it would join another link, another group. Okay. Now, once, since I've done this, it should drop out of that 200 group eventually. Yep, and see now it's dropped out of the 200 listed node because it no longer has that address. But that is how it's getting, that's how this whole process takes place. And that is how 
it can figure out the MAC address using neighbor solicitations and neighbor advertisements. Okay, now that was a long winded way to say something that's somewhat simple. Now I am gonna pull this up because this particular packet tracer, um, I had one of the students talking, one of your uh, classmates talking about it. And I have to fully admit to you that this particular packet tracer is a bear, okay? It's a very confusing packet tracer to do something, to show something that should be really simple. Okay, so let me get this pulled over here. So what we're doing here is trying to see the neighbor discovery process taking place on a I somehow opened this thing twice because I was impatient. Give me just a second, I gotta close one of them. Otherwise, I will definitely get confused. All right. So, this is going to use the simulation process of Packet Tracer, and it's also going to show um, the neighbor discovery process. So, I go in here, and the first thing you want to do is just make sure there's nothing in the neighbor table for. The router. If there is, you have to you have to clear it, but there's nothing there. Okay. Then you go into PC one A, and they want you to um, go into command prompt, and then I'm going to actually go into simulation mode. So when I click simulation, you will see that we have now um, our simulation mode going on, and I think I know part of the problem of why there's been some issues. And it says, in simulation mode, bottom right hand corner, make sure the show all none events are turned on. So I'm going to make sure show all none are turned on. So it should say none here. And then it says, from the PC1 prompt, ping. So we're going to go ping dash n1, which is once 2001 colon db8 colon acad colon one colon colon b and hit enter. Now, what you need to realize is until I click the forward button, nothing's gonna happen. So you see it sent one ping and you got a reply. And then it says, now we're gonna go into the edit filters and edit to see ICMP version six and neighbor discovery protocol. You will notice now that it says you should only see about um, what, 12 entries um, uh, that, is not true, okay? So you're actually seeing a lot more than that. Oh, and I clicked the wrong thing. Okay. You should see oh, now I can't get this back up. Good gracious. You should only see 12 entries, but you're actually seeing like 100 entries. So it's really not extremely easy to do. Dr. Um, but the, I would like, Dr. Reynolds, I'd like for you to actually um, write the answers on these in just a little notepad, notepad or WordPad document and upload them with your PKA file on these when you've got, when you've got those, because that way you can, I know you've, you've done the lab. All right. Back over here. But so simulation here, here, ping. Oh, I gotta go show all the ping. And then now we're going to fast forward it so it takes place. Make sure our ping worked. Our ping did. Because I used the wrong address, I believe, here. Yep, wrong address. One, colon, db8. Boom. Clear event hit. 
Let's do this. All right, and that worked. And then now we can actually go into edit filters, do IPv6, do neighbor discovery protocol, close this, and you're gonna see a bunch of stuff. But it's gonna, it's stating you only are gonna see like 12 entries. No. It also says, why are neighbor discovery PDUs present? Well, one of the things here is if you don't do the following, you won't realize it's a neighbor discovery protocol. You can't see it there. So unless you pull this over, you don't see that it's a neighbor discovery protocol, okay? So these are neighbor discovery protocols and all of these are failing because I sent it to the wrong address earlier, okay? And so as we continue on, eventually there should be a neighbor discovery protocol to get sent. Let's look at one of these, let's look, okay? So we're looking at where it's being sent and the information it's being sent to. And so we, all they're really trying to get you to do is to look at the neighbor discovery protocols and the neighbor solicitations that come back. Because I mistyped the IP address, we've got a mess in here um, on this one for this entire example. So there's that. Um, we got a mess on this example because I typed in the wrong address. So this is a very confusing lab that I think honestly doesn't do a lot to help you understand about how neighbor discovery works, okay? Um, I'm thinking what we're gonna do is we're probably gonna just do a video on it and walk through it for you um, and get that uh, done. Can I, 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 can I, I I'll just make this one comment, then I have to leave. But I'm gonna be honest. I found a guy on the YouTube. That's the only way I could get through this lab to figure out what are they doing, what do they want, what are they talking about. Is that okay? Yeah, if you got to send it, and I'll post it because no need reinvent, reinventing the wheel. Yeah, email that to me because yeah, I'll gladly use somebody else's work. I think I it's found, ACA. I, yeah, I found them for almost all of the labs. Yeah, Lorraine help me with this a lot um the only thing i ask is try the lab first by yourself before you do that um that way i don't want you just watching somebody else do it and then go through it just doing that don't only use it if you get stuck um Billy, yes. what this is lorraine what i found help because i don't have the experience that karen has yeah is the the video says here's what you do here's why you do it I stop it and then I get to do it. He actually takes it a next level up. He does explain why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that's that's fine. If y'all will send me that, I'll post it in the class for everybody and I'll put it under module, I'll put it in the section under module eight and nine so everybody can watch it. So as long as it's uh, there's nothing in it that would be objectionable. Yeah, just send it to me and I'll do that. Um, and I got a good question here from um, Dr. Ward, he's, he's, or Dr. Reynolds, sorry. He was asking about, um, he did a simple PDU to demonstrate the art process and you left the simulation running. You started seeing STP or DTP. You probably saw STP messages, that's called spanning tree. And that's because switches send out spanning tree messages on, all, on their ports looking for loops. And so um, you will see those as they are being simulated in the packet tracer simulation tool. So yeah, that's, that's something you will commonly see. So yeah, let, let, me, let me have that Lorraine, I'll forward it out to everybody. And if that doesn't work, we'll do, a, we'll do a, uh, an actual one for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Aaron, yeah, yeah. you're gonna have the to reason, do that one because I haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. The reason they're doing X's, you're getting X's when the STP goes to the host is because host drop STP. They don't speak that protocol. It's a special layer two protocol that only switches are supposed to speak. So when that STP protocol gets to the host, the host just says, oh, I can't, I don't run STP. I don't speak that language and it chucks it. So that's why you're seeing that. Yep. Good question. Very good. So to recap, let's pull up our lovely little notepad, okay, our handy dandy notepad. IPv4 uses ARP and it is broadcast based. IPv6 
uses neighbor solicitation. And it is multicast based. But both of these are to find a MAC address from a known IP address. So they're both solving the same problem. They're just using two slightly different ways to solve it. That is the takeaway from module nine. Any other questions? And I know you may still be confused. If so, go back through module nine again. We'll come back to it and talk about it next Wednesday. We are, remember, no class on Monday because of July 4th day, um, but we will come back on Wednesday and we're going to go through the basic router config and really start getting into our addressing as we move forward because um, we're getting there, folks. We're slowly but surely getting there. Any questions? I'm going to stop sharing. Any questions? By the way, I have to tell everyone we got 21 folks in here right now. We've averaged around 30 people out of the, I think we have about 89 or 90 people left in class, maybe close to 100. Uh, I think we actually got about 100 left in class. We got a lot of people drop once they saw how much work it is. So I really appreciate all of you being willing to be in class and to be here. Um, it is very nice not to be staring at a screen and talking to yourself. Um, it's also very good to see this type of participation. So I hope you're enjoying the class. Um, I'm sorry again that, that we had so much travel over the past couple of weeks. Um, in two weeks time, Brian and Michael will be taking over for an entire week as I head to Argentina. Um, so, but other than that, we are, we're all we're all getting there. We've started grading. I graded um, most of what was in three and four today, and so especially packet tracers. Michael has started or should have started grading uh, the first couple modules, um, depending on how he's feeling. I know he didn't feel very good yesterday, um, so just be aware we'll we'll be grading now as we're going along. Um, and for grading, most basically what we do is I look to see if you had any problems. If you didn't, you get a hundred on it. So we're not trying to kill you here. We're just trying to make sure you learn the information. Um, and be aware too, where do you see the grades? You'll look in your grade book. So just go in your grade book on the left-hand side of the class. So if you're inside the class, you should see um, along the left-hand side, a, a grades item. So you should... oh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. This is Alex here. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, I was wondering if we're gonna get any kind of certificate upon completion of this class. Yes. Since this was announced as an instructor training class, is there any credential that we can show as proof of completion to our supervisors? You will get a certificate of completion at the end of this directly from the NETACAD. You will also get a badge from Cisco um, through a Credly or through Credly that shows you successfully completed this class. And last but not least, since this is a continuing education course at Stanley Community College, you will receive a CEU certificate. You have to request it yourself and I'll give you the link for it. But if you successfully complete this class, you will get a CEU certificate uh, for, I think this is an, it's an 80 hour class. So this is eight CEUs. Um, so you'll be able to put in, well, it's eight CEUs for us. Depends on how okay. your school looks at it, but you will get a um, all three of those, a badge, certificate, and a CEU certificate. Is that a, is that a digital badge? Yes, digital okay. badge through Credly. Perfect. Perfect. That's great. Another question is I use a lot of notes. I, I make a lot of notes with snapshots and stuff like that. Is that okay to use them on the chapter exams? Um, yes, but I would say try to do it first without them. Okay. Do it, or do it without them just to kind of because I think if you do that, you're you're better assessing your knowledge. Um, and the reason being you're not going to have those when you take the certification exam. Right, right. So def definitely when you take, there's a practice certification exam at the end of season A3, um, then, you know, we'll we'll go from there. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think try them first without it. And then if you want to use it, then you can. Are we going to take an official Cisco test at, at the end of this course? You take an official final written exam in this course, but it's not- In this course. Right, it's just in this course, yeah. Okay. After the end of three, you can go take your CCNA. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have two questions in chat. 
First off, I'll get Earl. So have you got any information on whether Grant will cover advanced routing and switching? Right now, I have not. I know I'm going to put $5,000 towards it, and I'm going to pay for 25 slots. So I know there will be at least 25 free slots. Um, what we will probably do if there's more than 25 people that want them is we'll randomly pick those 25 with a random number generator. All right. Um, I'm, I have put in with both my business development managers from Cisco for another 5,000. So I'm hoping to actually get 15,000 to be able to, to make that happen. Um, no, Earl, don't worry about sending an email for that. If you finish this, we'll, we'll get that when we get toward the end of this class on that one. And then Dan had a question. He's asking, what are the stamps on the wall? Um, those are federal duck stamps. Um, if you, in the United States, if you're a duck hunter, you'll know this, but uh, or a conservationist, because a lot of people who are part of the Audubon Society buy a duck stamp every year. It's a 25 to $30 uh, stamp that actually all the proceeds go to support our national wildlife refuges. So um, in order to duck hunt in the United States, you must buy a stamp and you must sign it with your name on it. Well, these, that is all the stamps my father had from the first year he hunted to the last year he hunted right before he died. So it's all of his stamps. Um, so it's a really, really neat thing. I've got all mine too, except for one year. I actually don't have it from 1987 and that was my freshman year in college. And all I can figure is I don't think I duck hunted that year. I think I stayed at school too much that year. Um, but that, that's what they are, the federal duck stamps. Yeah, it is, it is one of probably one of my most prized things because it's all my dad's federal stamps. And then these are, these are various state stamps from Arkansas and, and other states we went to. So yeah, it's very, very cool. It's really neat too, because it's got a signature on every single one of them. Um, it goes back to like 1977 or 78, which is neat. All right. Any other questions? All right, folks, I will stop the recording.